All right, great. Well, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion about Indigenous journalism. It's hosted by the Craig Newmar Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. My name is Emily Labor Warren, and I'm a professor here. Today is the first of what we hope will become a regular series of events, conversations, and trainings here at Newmark J School to help create more and better journalism by, for, and about Native and Indigenous communities. It's a new initiative for us. Uh, this grew out of discussions that began earlier this year about crafting a land acknowledgement that would be placed in our lobby to recognize that the building that houses our school here in Midtown Manhattan sits on territory that was violently taken from the Lenape people and that journalists played a key role in the atrocities perpetrated against Native Americans. We gathered a committee of interested faculty, staff, students, and alumni, and the first thing we agreed on is that our school has lots of work to do before we can credibly erect such a plaque. We hope to recruit more Indigenous students and faculty to teach and learn at Newmark J School. We are honored that this coming January 13th, Graham Lee Brewer, a national investigative reporter at NBC News and a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, will be teaching a workshop for us over Zoom uncovering Indigenous issues. In case anyone here is interested in signing up for that, we will be emailing you later on with that information. Today's panel is moderated by two members of our school community, both of whom are Indigenous. Robert Pluma is a Kwawitikan, Tejano, and Mexican-American Indigenous futurist. Currently a student at Newmark J School, Robert is a Magnum Foundation grantee and Tau Knight scholar whose work has been featured in exhibitions, film, print, broadcast, and digital media, including National Geographic and the Tribeca Film Festival. Amy Stratton is a Black Indigenous queer femme from the Chickahominy tribe of Virginia. She is also a bilingual multimedia journalist, podcast host, documentary filmmaker, and the creator of a body positive cultural fashion brand, The Chief of Style. Amy graduated from Newmark J School in 2011. And while she was a student here, she produced a short documentary about her tribe's decades long struggle for federal recognition called The Chickahominy Fight. She was also a postgraduate fellow at the Tau Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at CUNY. So now with deep thanks, I will turn this event over to Amy and Robert. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. I'm so glad we are doing this. This is so very necessary. Um, I wanted to introduce Mark Trahant, who is a legend. He is the editor of Indian Country Today and is a member of the Shoshone Bannock tribes. Indian Country Today, for those who are not familiar, is a daily digital news platform that covers the indigenous world, including American Indians, Alaska Natives, and First Nations. Uh, Indian Country Today's success is nothing short of phenomenal. The digital site went out of business in 2017, and Trey Hant was hired to bring the publication back to life. The digital site now reaches an audience of 500,000 per month, and the broadcast is carried on two dozen public television stations. Trahant is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has held an endowed chair at the, at the University of North Dakota and the University of Alaska Anchorage. He has worked as an editor, a columnist, and reporter, and he's best known for his election coverage uh, reporting on Indian country, developing the first comprehensive database of American Indians and Alaska Natives running for office. His research has been cited in publications ranging from the New York Times to The Economist, and most recently, Teen Vogue. Uh, he was appointed to lead Indian Country Today as a digital enterprise on March 1st of 2018. Thank you so much, Mark. Delighted well, to be here. Hi folks, my name is Robert Pluma and I'm very excited to introduce Suzette Brewer. Uh, she is from Cherokee Nation and a journalist specializing in federal Indian law and social justice, whose books include Real Indians, Portraits of Contemporary Native Americans and America's Tribal Colleges. She's a writer specializing, uh, again, in federal Indian law, a little replication there. Uh, and she's written extensively on the Indian Child Welfare Act, the Supreme Court, native voting rights, environmental issues on Indian reservations, the opioid crisis, and violence against Native women and children. 
She has written for Indian Country Today, Rewire, the Dallas Morning News, the Denver Post, the Lumina Foundation, and many others. Uh, her broadcast work includes A Broken Trust, Sexual Assault and Justice on Tribal Lands, her Scripps News Service in Washington, DC, which won the John F. Kennedy Journalism Grand Prize for reporting on human rights and social justice. She is the 2015 recipient of the Richard LaCour Gannett Foundation, Al Newhearth Investigative Journalism Award for her work on the Indian Child Welfare Act. She is a 2018 John J. Toe uh, Juvenile Justice Reporting Fellow. She is from Stillwell, Oklahoma, and is a brilliant legal mind, and I'm excited for the things that she's gonna share with us today. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, it's my pleasure to be here, thank you. So the first thing um, I, I really want to do is give uh, the folks at home some context. So, you know, in recent years, I feel like we've gone from using the term Native American to indigenous, and that's a very, you know, kind of, uh, a lot of people are really, you know, feeling really powerful and um, unified in using the term indigenous. And I'm wondering, Mark, um, has Indian Country Today focused on using the word indigenous or is Native American still the, the term we should all be using? Um, you know, how do you feel about that? How does the publication feel on that issue? And um, I'd be happy to share our style book because it actually has quite a bit on it. We um, have been going through a lot of changes on this very topic. Um, when I first came, we really had the idea that Indian Country Today was our legacy and we were kind of wedded to that. And then when George Floyd happened, we started to say, we got to rethink these things. And we've been going through that with a year long process. And yesterday we had our anniversary celebration for Indian Country Today's 40 year history. And at that celebration, they, uh, we released our new logo which will be um, put into place at the beginning of the year. And it's just ICT. And the reason for that is we wanted people to um, come up with their own conclusion. Our, our research is that younger people and our number one demographic is 25 to 34. And that's been pretty consistent. Younger people do not like the term Indian and it's just very clear. And uh, they use indigenous or they use other uh, names. Our style book, and I think this is really important, emphasizes tribal connections first. So uh, very first reference would be uh, Navajo, Diné, uh, or whatever the person is. And that, and that also is interesting because that's changing really dramatically as well. A lot of tribes have names that the Bureau of Indian Affairs gave them. And young people are saying, uh-uh, that's not who we are. And young people are actually demanding the tribes change their name. Navajo is probably the largest in that category. And our staff has several uh, Diné members and they don't use uh, Navajo in all of their writings. It's always Diné, uh, which is interesting because um, then you get into the precision of journalism. You can be Diné, but you can't be a Diné citizen because there is no citizen of Diné. It's the Navajo Nation. So it, it requires precision in how you report. Right. And um, Suzette, I'm wondering, can you help us define what Indian country is? Because you know, the publication Indian Country Today presumes you understand what Indian Country is. And I use the term all the time and I feel like people don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so how would you define it if someone were to ask you? Yeah, well, actually we had uh, major discussions around the term Indian Country when I was working with Scripps on the documentary, A Broken Trust. Um, they were reluctant to use that word, but that's, that's the term. Um, I think you know the description of Indian Country today, as I understand it, really is um, it stretches from Alaska to Maine. I mean, everywhere is Indian Country in the United States. Um, so, but for the purposes of federal Indian law, it really uh, you know I, I just want to first acknowledge that it's all Indian land. You know, there's not a single uh, you know acre of this country that you know wasn't originally inhabited by Indigenous people. But for the purposes of federal Indian law, it really sort of um, falls to the, uh, the land categorizations, you know, in regards to the reservations and uh, unceded territories and ceded territories. And, and it really has to do with the boundaries of those, those communities. And so, uh, but when we talk about Indian country, we really meet it in the aggregate, you know, uh, you know, uh, because 
I think at least in the in the writing that I do, um, I know when uh, the, the Supreme Court is referring to Indian country, they're referring to all Indians on Indian land. And you can be, to Mark's point, you can be a Cherokee Nation member and still be at Navajo, but you're still an Indian on Indian land. So, I mean, that's sort of the, the other distinction is that yes, it belongs to the people on those, on those reservations or in those communities. But, you know, if you are a, a federally recognized member of a tribe, then uh, you are considered under, if anything happens, for example, on a reservation, then it's considered an Indian on Indian land, which is Indian country. So there's, it's, it's, I, I agree with Mark that these these changes are coming and I welcome these changes because I, I think it's it's been sort of homogenized uh, to death over the last 150 years. Um, you know, and I absolutely agree with the the nuance that's required when referring to someone's tribal affiliation, right? Um, and so I just think that, you know, to your question, uh, Indian, Indian country really applies to, there's, in my, in my mind, two different definitions, well, three, there's the whole country, then there's the reservations, then there's the communities, and then there's the people in those communities. And that is referred to under federal law as Indian country. It seems like we are uh, acknowledging a, a definition of terms and a difference in culture and the law. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's very, very important for anyone covering Indian country to understand and to do a deep dive on in terms of this history and what all this means. And there's also a lot of new uh, groundwork being laid, some of it not so great in the legal realm. And there are a couple of cases before the Supreme Court recently and some that are, that are yet to be resolved that are gonna have a tremendous impact on all indigenous peoples in, in this land. Um, so I was wondering if we could then discuss sovereignty and that concept and how that applies here and its significance. What, what is sovereign Indian land and why, why should we care? Mark? Well, I uh, once asked the president of the United States that question. Um, <laughs> which one? Which one? <laughs> one, yeah, which one? <laughs> that would be George Bush, W. Bush. Oh. <laughs> um, this may be way too esoteric, but let me throw it out there anyway. One of the ways I view sovereignty is that tribal communities in this country have a 10 to 15,000 year history that predates the United States and will outlast the United States. And that tribal communities have that connection to the North America, Turtle Island in a way that is permanent. That and I would say uh, really what sovereignty means, uh, again, for the purposes of law, is it refers to the jurisdiction of the tribe in regards to its, uh, the functioning of these tribal governments, right? And so you have a land base and juris uh, sovereignty really has to do with the health, the human services, the infrastructure, you know, the power to tax, for example. Uh, the power to tax and regulation are the two pillars of federal Indian law. And so it really goes toward the governance aspect of the tribes in terms of what is the jurisdiction. And so like, let's say, and I can, you know, make it very simplified in the sense that let's say you've got um, you know, uh, and there are some tribes that have this little amount of land, but let's say you've got a four acre reservation. Um, and so there's a tribal government there. So that tribal government is responsible for all of the activities that take place, law enforcement, education, healthcare, uh, health and human services, basically all those things that falls under their sovereign, you know, that falls under their sovereignty. And so, but I, I will say that the tribes are still, um, I think in, in some aspects, in some areas of the country, I think, you know, some are more ahead than others in terms of what their legal status is in regards to their sovereignty. I think everybody has the same goals in mind, but I think the, the um, you know, the playing field isn't always equal because, you know, largely it depends on where they're located. 
Um, for example, I think the Shakopee of Minnesota is a very good example. They're a very small tribe. They only have, I think, 750 acres. I, I want to say it's not very big. Um, you know, obviously, financially speaking, they're in a much better position to, to be able to administer those services. You have a tribe out in the middle of nowhere, um, because again, gaming is part of the, the equation now. It's a, it's a location-based business. And so they're not maybe as able, financially speaking, to um, you know, provide certain services that wealthier tribes could. But really, sovereignty really breaks down to who has control over the land and who has the power to tax and who has the power to um, you know, uh, basically enforce its laws. Um, and so, and then you get into the, the areas of Public Law 280 and Fed states. What we call Public Law 280 is where the state has jurisdiction over torts, over civil, uh, civil actions, and then like divorces, um, civil liability for criminal, uh, or yeah, civil liability for criminal conduct. Um, and then you have the Fed states where the federal government, so the district attorneys are responsible for jurisdiction in the public law 280 states, the federal government has jurisdiction in what we call the Fed states. There are currently, I think, there are six original public law 280 states, including Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, California, Florida, and uh, Alaska, as a matter of fact. And so I think there were six more that were added on to that later on. This was a 1953 law that the states actually lobbied for, but at a certain point, uh, they realized it was, once it was passed into law, it became what they refer to as an unfunded mandate. Um, so that didn't really, that was not the panacea that the states thought it was gonna be in terms of law enforcement and in terms of jurisdiction. On the Fed side, you have states like Montana, uh, North Dakota, uh, South Dakota, those tribes in those states fought heavily against Public Law 280, so they are not included in that category with the exception of Salish Kootenai in Montana. Uh, now they are a voluntary public law 280 reservation, whereas the Menominee in Wisconsin, which is the public law 280 state is a, by, vol the, by voluntary uh, action, uh, they are a fed reservation. So it's this jumble mix, if you will, of different types of jurisdiction, different types of sovereignty. Um, so I, I think when we talk about sovereignty, really uh, just to break it down to its very base um, meaning under the law is it's, it's basically who controls this chunk of land and who has responsibility for its people. That's sovereignty. So, you know, I know that you've written quite a bit on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, um, the Violence Against Women Act and how that impacts indigenous women. How does sovereignty, how's that impacted your reporting? Or, you know, I mean, there's so much there. And I think to cover missing and murdered indigenous women, you have to understand sovereignty. So can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, that is one of the most difficult things I've ever had to cover because of the cracks in the system. Uh, that because of these various issues in terms of nobody wants sovereignty. I mean, no, I shouldn't say that. Nobody on the state or federal government side wants responsibility for these things that happen. Um, you know, we know, for example, I mean, uh, we know that murdered and missing are that whole uh, realm of reporting really is tied into several other uh, several other issues, including human trafficking and, you know, various other uh, sort of incidents that or situations that people wind up going missing and murdered. Uh, domestic violence plays a big part of it. Um, and one of the things that, that I can tell you is that, you know, often the jurisdiction uh, becomes a broken chain in terms of chain of command or a chain of uh, custody in regards to evidence and that sort of thing. Um, I know when I, uh, when we were reporting on a broken trust, that took us two solid years and, and we filed probably half a dozen FOIAs trying to get information from the federal government that should have been, um, you know, it should have been readily available and it was, uh, but they dragged their feet for a solid two years until, you know, we had to basically twist their arms to hand over declination rates even. They didn't even want to give us declination rates. So, in regards to you know sexual assault, murdered and missing Indigenous women, uh, domestic violence, and, and and those types of things that happen in the communities, um, you know I think I, I believe at Fort Berthold, uh, the, out of 166 cases over a five-year period, they only 
had two convictions. Um, one, both of those were um, a year because it, they can only sentence a year because of the sentencing restrictions. And, but they only, ser- I think one served four months and the other served six months. And it was for aggravated rape with a weapon, with using a, like a, an object. And um, people often who have seen the documentary are, are shocked and appalled at the sentencing in those cases. But that is what the tribes under federal law, that's all they can do because that's under the, um, the Indian, oh, I forget the name of it, but it's an act it, and it basically restricts them from any more sentencing than that. So from the minute the event happens, you know, through the investigation and the, you know, the people showing up on the scene, at that point, they have to identify who's native, who's not, that informs the rest of the case. Um, But typically what happens is that, you know, the the states or or the U.S. attorneys will decline cases. And the district attorneys in the public law 280 states will decline cases based on lack of evidence. Uh, I have personally been involved in a couple of these cases where there there really was no lack of evidence. They just didn't want to do it. And that's really what it boils down to. It's just a lack of energy, um, a lack of uh, concern really uh, for the people who who have to live in these communities. And so um, I I can just say, I mean, I can't speak for everybody who covers these issues. I just know for um, myself and my colleagues that have covered it, it, it's a tough, tough road to hoe because It is a never ending onion that you're continually on peeling and it happens every single day and it happens with such speed and such um, prevalence that it's hard, honestly, to to stay on top of it. Um, So I hope that answers your question. Um, But I just think that there there are many, many cracks in the system that that allow perpetrators and human traffickers and uh, abusers to go free. So there are two very interesting things we've revealed here. One is that we are talking about um, sovereign nations. It's like international reporting and in a sense in that way. And this is also just so clearly already deeply complicated and requires a lot of work on the part of anyone wanting to report on these issues. This is not a, a subject matter that we can just drop right into without some sort of prior knowledge. So, um, for any journalists who are not familiar, but interested in covering these subjects, uh, how do we help them feel not disincentivized, but encouraged to actually bring more attention to these issues that are desperately in need of more coverage? And what are some best practices for that? Um, I'd love to hear from you both, and perhaps we can start with Mark. Sure. Um, I think one of the key things is just um, not working on a deadline story and starting from scratch, building sources and talking to people and indeed um, hanging out. Sometimes it's not even going, just going into a community and talking to people over time rather than trying to make it so uh, you're trying to report on deadline. Um, these are very, as you've hit, it, it are enormously complex. And um, I mean, one of the things we see with murdered and missing indigenous relatives that's also true with COVID is how do you, what do you trust data for? And how do you make sure that data has some meaning to it? Um, we've been really working hard to build a database of um, casualty rates for COVID. And um, it's the Indian Health Service doesn't keep track. The tribal facilities don't keep track. And by law, tribal facilities do not need to report to the Indian Health Service. And, and then the states don't even measure. And so you get these three data sets that uh, on their own are interesting, but you put them together and they mean nothing. And that's a real challenge is to try to figure out how to build better data. It's one we're spending enormous time on now. I will co-sign that. Let me just say, uh, data in Indian country is an absolute disaster. And it's something that throughout my entire career, whether I'm reporting or whatever else I'm working on, whether it's law enforcement, education, housing, um, as Mark points out, you know, healthcare statistics, um, you know, uh, it, it, 
it is a whack-a-mole approach to data where you look over here and it's one thing, you look over there, it's one thing. We could even take education as an example. Education K through 12, and you have to be really specific, uh, K through 12 education in the United, in, in native education in the United States, you have Bureau of Indian Education, you've got the tribal schools, you've got um, the mission schools still like St. LeBray and St. Joe's. Um, and they all have their own siloed reporting, you know, so you can't just go and say, we've always said, I think since I began writing in Indian country, and that was like 30 years ago, um, you can't just go in and say, well, we've always said there's a 50, 56% dropout rate among native high school students, for example. Um, we don't know, to be honest, that's the number that, you know, we can guess about, but I think that's just the one that everyone has landed on as sort of an agreement, but I honestly think it's higher. I think it's closer to 70, to be quite honest. But I think we'll never really know because as Mark points out, we've got all these pots of information all over the place. And even the federal government, um, as I mentioned in the previous story, working on uh, you know just declination rates for you know sexual assault, we couldn't even get that. And I actually, here's what I did. What I did, Mark, was I, I reverse engineered the numbers. I took the numbers from North Dakota, uh, all 77 counties, and I looked at the counties in particular where there was you know, a, a spike in sexual assault. And when Hornbuckle over at the DOJ had been dragging his feet for two years, um, and finally, you know, he was on the phone one day with my colleagues and I could hear him just dragging his feet again. So I just basically told him it's 73%. And he was shocked and he stopped there, you know, there was like this silence on the other end of the phone. He was in DC, we were in North Dakota. And um, he said, and then he says, I quote verbatim, how did you know that? After dragging his feet for two years. And I said, because Mark, I can count. I'm uh, not Mark, sorry, win, <laughs> because I can count. And, um, you know, I looked at all the counties and, you know, for example, Fort Berthold sits on six counties. I went to all of their district attorneys. I went to all their courthouses. I went to every single courthouse on the reservation, you know, the civil courthouse, like the ones that are run by the state to find those numbers. And, uh, and the same for Turtle Mountain, Sisson and Wapit and Standing Rock and so on. And, you know, inevitably in the counties where, you know, the tribes existed, there was a higher spike in um, declination rates than there was for the rest of the state. Um, and it turns out, so then he finally, in that conversation gave us the number, it was 72%, which is still egregious. And it's only 1% off of what I had. Um, but it, it just tells you like, it, you know, it's something that data in itself is one of the biggest issues in Indian country in terms of reporting, in terms of leaving hundreds of millions of dollars on the table for housing, for law enforcement, for education and all these things. Um, but I just wanna say that uh, it, it is an, an ongoing battle to try to come to those numbers when, you when you're trying to report, you know, just, even on a basic story, even if you are on deadline, it's still, it's still very difficult. But I, I want to say, I want to dovetail uh, with what Mark said too. These are complex stories. And I think, the, honestly, I think he's absolutely right. You can't go into something like this on deadline, a five o'clock deadline where you've got, you know, 15 inches to write or 20 inches to write. And you're trying to break down this enormously complex case. I think Veronica is a very good example of that, baby Veronica. You know, they were all sort of writing these in the mainstream media was writing all these little 10, 15 inch stories about, you know, this case, some case that was happening in Oklahoma. But, you know, when I saw the, the court papers for that thing, I knew that this was going to be something where the Supreme Court was going to be asked to determine who's an Indian from the bench. And so I think you have to really go in and I, I would say the first things first, you've got to research, you got to research the community, you got to know what you're doing. Um, you got to research the subject itself. You know, if you don't know about Public Law 280, it's a good idea to go get a primer on it. Um, if you uh, don't know about murdered and missing Indigenous women, I mean, there are resources out there, but you know, you have to, you know, you really have to get in there and get your elbows dirty, and you've got to just go out there and go to the communities. Um, and um, 
I think going to the communities is probably one of the more important things you can do um, because if you can, because that's where you're going to really get the true story. I think just calling people up from a desk in New York and trying to make sense of something that has been dragging on for 150 years, as in the case of like an environmental disaster. Um, and here I could point to, you know, uh, the, the Gold King mine spill in Colorado. That thing, that's not the first thing, time that thing is, had ever er, erupted in, in 2015. Um, it's been going on since, you know, this, the silver mines were in place in the 1800s. Um, so it really took a long time. I actually went to Navajo to, to talk to the hydrologists, to talk to the tribal leadership, to talk to the people who were affected by this thing. And you can't do that over the phone. But I just, I think that research and really understanding the topic, and I think, you know, getting out to the communities are very important. Also in terms of just gaining, you know, their trust. And, you know, the truth is if you want something from the tribes, you got to go see them. You know, I mean, that's just, that's just polite. <laughs> you know, that's I was going to say to that point, I also know that just to report in Indian country, it really is about trust. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, unless you have a relationship with a tribe, it's really hard to just write a story for five o'clock. Um, it takes time, you know, kind of to develop that relationship with the tribe to get that trust, because I think a lot of tribes have really been like screwed over by press, you know, getting it wrong. Um, so I think, you know, sort of developing that relationship is really important. And I think we see, we see examples of that um, in mainstream news where people kind of understand that, but I feel like that's sometimes lost when it comes on, you know, reporting in Indian country for non-Indigenous folks, at least. Um, so hopefully, you know, this panel will change that <laughs> for a lot of people. Um, I wanted to, to shift a little bit um, over to a conversation around the digital divide. Um, so I have a, from a 2018 report, um, the American Library Association said nearly seven in 10 residents on rural tribal lands remain without access to fixed high capacity broadband and are cut off from educational and economic opportunities. And, you know, there's many, um, uh, many reasons why that is and many reasons or many things that will come from that, um, you know, lack of access to jobs or, um, you know, taking classes at home, you know, during COVID, things like that that are impacted. Um, but I know that, you know, Indian Country Today has been revived thanks to Mark and, you know, you, you now are um, working with PBS on this, um, uh, you know, television show that's being broadcasted. Um, and I just was hoping that you could speak a little bit um, to that and, and how you're kind of addressing this digital divide um, while still having a digital news operation. Well, I mean, there are several layers there. One, uh, when we re relaunched, we decided to make mobile our primary focus. And our mobile audience is about 80%. So um, we don't spend much time thinking, at least for our product, on what it looks like on the web or how people are consuming it on the web because that, that's just not our users. Uh, but you know, on the digital divide, there's two quick points. Um, one is we're about to see what happens with the largest single investment in broadband in the history of this country. And how that unfolds is gonna be really fascinating. And if folks, I mean, around the world, you're seeing folks saying, do we wanna create an infrastructure with wires or we want to do things differently. And it'll be interesting to see whether Indian country follows and collective tribal uh, leaders follows the model of the world or follows the model with the United States. There will be enormous pressure for them to do it the way the United States is doing, but it really is not a very efficient model. Um, so that's something to watch going forward. Where you really saw this, and uh, I think it probably showed how bad it is, is when kids were sent home from school and you had kids lined up at a McDonald's to use the internet. And um, that, that's really extraordinary and something that needs to be fixed. You could start with making sure all the schools have good access and good uh, node points that anybody can use and then build out from there. Uh, but whether households will get it, and, and there has been tremendous improvements already. I remember, particularly at Navajo, 10 years ago, you had to go stand on a hill with your leg up and point the phone a certain direction. And now pretty much every carrier you can drive across the reservation and except for a few remote spots have really good access. But I really think we need to think through what 
technology we need because it's changing so fast. And what people think of in this broadband bill is a really good example of that may not be what's required. Uh, for television, it's particularly interesting because we are still wedded to time-based television and young people are not. And we're putting out a show and it ranges most markets, but some around 11 o'clock. And our audience on television is exactly opposite our digital audience. It's plus 65 is people who watch TV every night. And that's just not young people at all. They'll want to watch one story or two stories. Uh, they'll share it. Uh, they'll connect in a very different way than previous generations. So it's partly technology, but it's also partly a change in, in thinking. Well, oh, I also want to mention here, I, before I go on, you, you know that Native people invented the internet. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so if you go back a thousand years, um, the ancient Pueblo communities were built on sacred road systems. And even now by satellite, if you look at those road systems, you can see how precise they were and how straight the roads were. And um, they, people weren't even allowed to walk on them. They had no transportation. They were not used for transportation at all. They were only used for communication. And uh, ancient Pueblo villages, which are significant in distance, could reach each other by a series of lights. And if you think about light on, light off is one comma zero, and that basically is the internet. And that was a thousand years ago. So the technology may be different, but the idea of it is pretty universal. That is absolutely correct. And it's true. And one of the things I want to say is I went to a uh, digital divide conference at Stanford in 2000, like 21 years ago. And uh, it was basically the same, um, I would say the same conversations that we're still having about uh, technology and the internet. Um, I think Mark is correct that, you know, I think the pandemic really did uh, bring into sharp focus, you know, the, the real issues on the Indian reservations, especially the remote ones um, where, and even in my hometown, there are kids who they know whose house in the neighborhood has like open Wi-Fi, and so you'll drive down the street in the middle of winter and they'll be out there in lawn chairs and blankets with their laptops trying to do their homework. And that is a real thing. And I think one of the things like my tribe tried to do was to give $400 stipends for technology, but it's one thing to have a, a Chromebook, but if you can't get Wi-Fi access, it's not gonna do you a whole lot of good. And that was one of the things that, you know, still in many parts of my home community, they, they don't have, like you drive out into the, the sticks and they don't have, they don't even have cell service. And most people at home do their homework on, on their cell phones. Um, and so it's, it's a nationwide problem. Uh, I think it's really difficult for those in, you know, places like Alaska get, that gets very little attention in the lower 48. Uh, Alaska is a, a big one. I, I wanna say the large Western states like Montana um, and some of the others like uh, North Dakota, South Dakota. I mean, it's part of it too has to do with infrastructure. That's one of the things I think uh, is, is probably the greatest thing about this infrastructure bill that came through. Um, but one of the things that we have to think about is, you know, from a legal standpoint is the easements that are required for these things. That's one of the things that I think for whatever reasons the tribe really haven't been able, the tribes haven't been able to really um, I mean, that was sort of a, a push in the Obama administration uh, was to uh, relieve some of the strict restrictions on the easements that are required for, you know, broadband access and cell phone towers and those sorts of things. But I think just over time, it, it just didn't happen. So I think, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, they're going to invest in these, you know, this thing or that thing. But I think, you know, getting access to those parts of those reservations uh, with the easements, I think is gonna be a big challenge, but we'll see. So I just wanna let the folks listening in know that we're gonna go to Q&A at seven. So if you have any questions, please prepare those ahead of that moment. And also we'll be sharing some resources, links and such and other information, including the Indian Country Today style guide that Amy shared in the chat. 
uh, via email when we share this recording. It might go out early next week, uh, but just keep an eye out for those things. Uh, now, Amy's gonna, gonna take on the next question, but I also know Mark had a brief follow-up to a previous uh, topic. Do you wanna say that now, Mark? Or sure, I, I just, okay. when we were talking about what you should know, um, one thing that I would really urge you to do is uh, do a bit, and I hate to use an academic word in this context, but do some epistemology. How do you know what you know? You really need to check that. And I'll give you an example of one story that the media almost always gets wrong, and that's with health. Um, and, and not just the media, Congress gets it wrong too. 60% um, of the Indian health system, and we use Indian health system now instead of Indian health service, 60% of the Indian health system is tribal. And some of the most innovative, interesting, fascinating operations are being done by these tribes. Uh, for example, um, in Alaska, they really brought to the forefront dental health therapy. They knew they couldn't get dentists into vi villages. So they started creating right out of high school, uh, a practicing level, a mid-level practitioner who does everything a dentist does, except for uh, having a medical license. And uh, this is, uh, again, something used around the world. When they first put it in, um, the American Dental Association fought it and they went all the way to the Supreme Court. The court was reviewed, uh, the ADA backed down and said, we're not gonna pursue it, but it's only in Alaska. And of course, everyone in Indian country said, oh yeah, just Alaska. And then immediately started doing it everywhere else. And um, it's created a whole new industry. And what's really great is it's created professions for kids uh, right out of high school, two-year programs, and it's opened up I mean, you had in some Alaska villages, the highest rates of juvenile caries disease in the yes. world. And now you have communities are cavity, cavity free in less than a decade. Yes. And, and that innovation is just a story that's not told about Indian health, but you can see it on so many levels. 40% uh, of the system is the old Indian health service and government um, still has problems carrying out healthcare delivery, but and here's another thing is that the Indian health system spends approximately the same as the median for the rest of the world. It's right on the money. It's just that the US system is so out of skew. Yes. And because of that, it makes everything look bad. Um, in 1970, when the Indian, or 75, when the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act became law, the disparity in health was about 40 years. And now it's less than five years. And there are still disparities, but it's really shrunk. It should be a great success story rather than this narrative of decline. Amy? Yeah, okay. So <laughs> we it seems as though you know the major topics, indigenous news topics that we see are you know, Native American imagery in sports and cultural appropriation and fashion and music. Um, we did discuss missing and murdered indigenous, as you said, relatives. Um, and uh, immigration, some, you know, talking about how a lot of folks who are put in detention centers are actually um, indigenous folks. Um, gaming, we see a lot of. What do you think are some hot topics that folks you know, on this call could explore, um, not with their 5 p.m. deadline, but maybe with a little bit of lead time? What are some hot topics maybe people can, can look into? Um, and any best practices for covering any of those stories, anything on your radar? Um, yeah. Well, one that I would, that comes immediately to mind is juvenile justice in Indian country. That is a very uh, underreported story. Um, I, that was part of my, my Tau fellowship uh, that I worked on. Um, the subject of the story was Brian Melendez and he is a member of the Reno Sparks Colony in uh, Nevada. Um, that was an eye opener. I mean, if there's, any, if there's any story that's probably more heartbreaking than ICWA or murdered and missing indigenous women, uh, in sexual assault. I mean, all of them are tragic, but I mean, the juvenile justice in Indian country is one of the, uh, I would say one of the most underreported stories in the country because these are minor children who are being sent to federal facilities with grown men. And because they are in fed states, they don't go to juvie. I mean, they do go to like sections of these federal prisons that are supposedly for 
um, juveniles, but you know, you've got kids in there who are like 10, 11, 12 years old who are like in a federal facility um, and it just goes on and on and it is generational. Um, and so I, I would say that's one of the ones. Uh, I, I think the environment uh, thankfully has become a major topic over the last, I would say 10 years for sure. Um, education, um, I think is, you know, in the education side, there's plenty of unreported stories there. Uh, but I would say, for, for me, I would say the most unreported stories are in juvenile justice. But uh, Mark probably has his own uh, set of stories that he probably uh, feels like need more sunlight. Uh, I mean, that's the great thing you can pick, throw a dart and pick a story. And get good. <laughs> um, two stories that I think are, are interesting that are going to get hotter. One is identity. Um, we're now at a time in generations where, let me use Alaska as an example. Um, a young person might not be a member of a corporation, a village that's a tribe, or any other group and still consider themselves Alaska Native. And uh, as that group grows in size and numbers, they're demanding rights that are different. Um, it's the same with tribes. The tribes in the, in the South that have really strict uh, blood quantum have basically guaranteed that their tribe won't exist in the future. And so they're gonna have to come up with new definitions and how that happens and what that process is, is going to be really fascinating. Uh, so it gets into the question. The one that I'm going to be working on next year that I'm really excited about is economics. And uh, we have an economic project we're about to launch. And one of the really cool things, and this really came out of Standing Rock. Well, it came out of Standing Rock, but also predates, is that um, the investment world is moving toward ESG investing, environmental, social, and governance. And in March 31st of this year, the Securities and Exchange Commission said it would become an enforceable measure. And so if a company says it's doing that, they've got to back it up. And that's going to open up all kinds of things uh, from Rio Tinto to uh, Pipeline 3 um, from the expansion of the pipeline. And um, I, do you have a follow up to that? I, I have a slightly off question, Robert. Did you have a question? Okay, so I know when we spoke before, Mark, you were mentioning how you had, an, I, and forgive me if these numbers are wrong, but I think you said you had five reporters in your newsroom, and then now you're hiring another 20, 25? I don't know, what was that? Well, we're going to double. Um, mostly, so um, right now, we just went through the budgets for next year, and uh, on the digital side, we're going to hire two more reporters. And then on the broadcast side, we're probably going to hire another four producers. So we've gone from four people four years ago to uh, 21. And eventually, in the next two, three years, we're looking to double that again. Uh, we've got a bureau in Anchorage. We've got a bureau. Uh, we want to do another bureau in the Southwest. And um, we have a partnership in Oregon. And I think we're open to more partnerships. It could be an area that we do where we'll partner with another news organization and pay half their salary. And that's where it worked really well for us so far. And then we have a DC Bureau. Um, and this probably is important for students. Uh, we have a different philosophy than most news organizations. And that is, we think we should pay well and that folks should come work here for a long time. We don't want them coming, learning a lot and then jumping to somebody else. So we try to make it a long-term proposition that we're investing in them and want them to build a career here. That's awesome. And do, like, to what do we owe this, you know, increase in staff? Because I feel like the story about journalism for the last decade has been the decline and that it's, you know, going like all these newsrooms are shutting down. But I know you guys recently went uh, nonprofit. Do you think that's a part of this? Like you mentioned partnerships, like Yeah, I think nonprofit's a key factor. Um, our business model is different. I mean, Yesterday, we did a fundraiser online, and this month we'll raise $40,000 from individuals. And I budgeted $200,000 for the year. And I think we're going to end the year about 230. I mean, we're really hitting um, our numbers. Foundations are really critical. Um, this, is, this is just a great time to be a nonprofit. People are looking at news differently than they did it. Uh, we are really radical in that sense that we don't copyright our product 
Anyone can use it for free. We encourage other news organizations to use our content for free. We um, have a robust partnership with the Associated Press where not only they pick up our copy, but we ship them other copy that they didn't work for the wire that they can send to members that they can use uh, again for free. So we kind of have a little different philosophy in some of that. I, I think the news media is in trouble because they stopped innovating and they just started to get, when they wanted to go back to the business the way it was, and that's just never going to happen again. I think this is the best time to start a career in journalism because it's not just us, but there are a lot of news organizations who are innovative uh, that are looking for new ways to do it. And um, that this should be a great time for someone to start a career. I love that. That needs to be in like the school brochure. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, Robert, I know you, you had some questions around education. I don't know if you want to bring that up now. Yeah, that was one of the major topics we wanted to discuss here. Obviously, as amazing as this panel has already been, uh, this isn't going to be enough of an education for people to really begin covering these issues. And I know, Mark, you're particularly keen on making sure people learn at an earlier age about Indigenous peoples, about sovereignty, about the various nations and peoples, and also trying to bring that to, uh, to journalism schools as well. And would you both like to, to share a little bit about what you think needs to happen education-wise to make progress here? Mark? <laughs> well, I'll start. I, one of the problems is journalism is trying to fix problems from society. And the problem of society is that kids go to school and they learn about city, county, state, federal, but they don't learn how tribes fit into that as constitutional entities. And um, there are some states that are addressing this in really thoughtful ways. Um, Montana really started it with Montana Indian Education for All. But now other states are following the same idea. And that's it. Basic idea is that you cannot be a good citizen unless you know the basics of how federal law works, how tribes fit into the system. And um, more and more states and more and more um, law schools are putting it into as a requirement. And I think both of those are going to be really significant over time. I think journalism education ought to do the same thing. It ought to be an accreditation standard that if your school is gonna be accredited, it has to have basic understanding of how tribes fit into the national story. Absolutely, I, I concur with everything he said. And I would just add to that, that's one of the things, I mean, that is part of the problem. I mean, I know even for us when we were in grade school, I mean, I didn't know when I was in sixth grade, for example, that there's 110 tribes in California. I didn't even know there were tribes in California. Um, and so I think it's one of those things where it is a systemic problem, um, but I think, you know, once you, uh, you know, once you're in this field, I think it is incumbent, whether you learned it or not in school, that you have to try to make the effort, not even try to make the effort, you have to make the effort to learn about America's 578 federally recognized tribes. You have to learn about what that means in terms of their sovereignty, in terms of the jurisdiction, in terms of what their issues are, and the fact that they're not all homogenous. You know, Mark's, you know, Shoshone Bannock, I'm Cherokee Nation, uh, and you guys, you know, you're Chickahominy, that there's such a diversity even on this panel in terms of what that means. And it, it's not all, as we always say, it's not always teepees and feather headdresses, but that's what the world sees, you know, through television and through the media. They see, you know, uh, what really in, in reality represents a very small portion of Indian country. You know, when you think about the fact that Oklahoma has almost 40 tribes, um, you know, Washington state alone. I mean, I, I dozens, uh, I, and but also it's about the linguistics, you know, it's about knowing, you know, uh, then all, not all tribes are the same. And as I mentioned to you guys the other day, uh, one of the big problems that I've had with reporters, um, is they, they truly don't know basic things and it's, they report on things that, that do make you cringe. Like I mentioned, the guy from the LA Times who thought Lakota and Sioux were two different tribes. Here's a guy, it was Glenn Kessler. I mean, I don't mind telling you who it was. I mean, he's no dummy. He writes to the Washington Post now. I mean, he's obviously gone up the ranks, but you know, he absolutely had no idea that, you know, there are certain things that, you know, you just have to know. And if you don't know, you know, there's no sin in that because, you know, that it's not taught properly in the schools. 
but you, but once you are in this field, it is incumbent to go look, it's incumbent to go, you know, you've got to, you've got to figure out what that's, you know, what it all means. And, you know, even when I was working with my colleagues um, on a broken trust, you know, one of the things that I was so impressed by um, because they were not Indians is the fact that they had taken the time to really go and, and look and see what is public law 280. I, and I've never met a set of non-Indian journalists that even understood what that meant, but they knew. And that was sort of what prompted me to work with them is because I, at that point, that's such an arcane piece of federal Indian law that is really critical in terms of what jurisdiction means and what sovereignty means that I, I, it, you know, it just occurred to me right then and there that, okay, these are people who have taken this thing seriously. Even before they brought me in, they knew what that meant. And so I just think it's important to, you know, we understand, uh, you know, uh, cause we've been in the trenches for many years, you know, writing on these things. And, you know, there's things that I've had to learn along the way. There's things I learn on every single story that I didn't know before, but you know, that just goes back into your arsenal. Right. That just goes right back into, you know, your knowledge base, because the fact of the matter is, especially in Indian country, when you're reporting on these things, knowledge truly is power. You know, you really have to know this subject matter. You don't have to know every single thing about every single tribe, but a basic 101, I think, would be very helpful to a lot of journalists, you know, to know how many recognized tribes there are maybe state recognized tribes to understand the linguistic groups, to understand the difference between um, you know, for example, let's say Apache and Navajo, they're both Athabascan. And what is Athabascan? Well, that's a tribe in Alaska. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, you, it's about learning the linguistic groups and that's how you gain trust when you go out into the communities. If they know that you've taken the time to understand the nuance of where they came from and, and their creation story even, or just understanding that Ojibwe and Chippewa mean the same thing and Ojibwe and Chippewa and Anishinaabe are all the same thing. I mean, they have different bands, but linguistically they're Anishinaabe. And so it's about understanding those nuances that really do help when you are you know, in the middle of a story because it's complex as it is. And so the more you can arm yourself with that kind of information going into it, the better off you're gonna be. And frankly, you're just gonna be a better reporter. I'm really interested that more than once we've talked about how it really takes more time and more consideration in, first of all, just learning how to tell these stories and then actually gathering and sharing them. Uh, and we really seem to be describing sort of more of an engagement approach that involves a lot more of that sort of activity. Um, what other uh, needs are there for a journalist in terms of their practice, in terms of what they need to learn in order to do a better job and educate themselves and how can we create more of that sort of resource for them to be able to learn about how to do that? In addition, oh. Go ahead, go ahead, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, well, and this gets into journalism education. Um, I would hope that one part of journalism education would be to making sure that the ranks of professors are more diverse so that they have an understanding and can teach it as part of the curriculum without having to explain why it's important. Um, that would be a start. And certainly when you look at, and one of the things we've been doing with databases is to take a profess profession, say state legislators, and then apply the 2% rule. If 2% is Native American, how does that compare to the state legislatures? And it ends up being 0.74%. Um, and so then you can start to look at what would it take to make it uh, some sort of parity. But you can do that across the board. I mean, the most egregious, perhaps other than journalism schools, is the federal bench. And um, right now that's 0.033%. <laughs> it's true. It's true. That's not great. <laughs> I mean, Suzette, I, I, did you have anything that you want to yeah, add before well, we of course, move to but I do. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, that, I think the disparity there, I think is, is true. Um, I think it's, it's one of those things where he's right. It's, you know, journalism education. And I think that, um, you know, having, you know, they're, they're, it's a very small population 
compared to everybody else, we're, he's right, 2%. And so, you know, what that means is, you know, you've got uh, approximately, I think, what is it, Mark, in the last census? What was it? 6.8? Or what was it for? I don't know. <laughs> Have they landed on a number yet? <laughs> I think it's about four, but it's, um, it's a big number. Yeah, it's bigger than it was, you know, because uh, I think when I started writing about Indian country, in a serious way. I mean, I'd done features and stuff before that, but when I moved over to hard news, I think it was 2.1 million. And so that was like 20 years ago, I think. Um, and so I think it, it really does require, like I said, uh, you know, I think one's uh, attention to these subjects. And I think that it really does require, uh, as Mark said, you know, people in front of the classroom that, um, you know, are diverse and have an understanding of, um, you know, why these things are important. Um, I, 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 it, it's a tough one, honestly, because I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of journalism schools out there and very few uh, native professors uh, that teach journalism. And I think, you know, that just makes it that much more, I think, difficult to get the word out. And that's why I'm always happy to try to participate in these kinds of panels, because I, I think, you know, we can't obviously be everywhere at once. Um, but what we can do is try to provide, you know, uh, as much, um, you know, pack as much in as we possibly can. And hopefully, you know, the folks over at, you know, <laughs> at your at your institution will be moved to, you know, start thinking about, you know, what it's going to take to um, to report on Indian country, because it is it is a very um, it's it's unique. It's niche in a certain sense, but it also applies to all the national issues that that uh, you see in mainstream news, uh, you know, because obviously everything that affects, you know, uh, us as a country, like we'll say COVID, you know, it doubly impacted, if not triply impacted native communities in the last year. Um, and so I think, you know, th there, and when I was doing reporting last year on, on COVID, you know, one of the stories that I did was on, you know, the lack of infrastructure in regards to education and healthcare because there are people, you know, last year that couldn't get to the hospitals, that couldn't get to the clinics to get tested, couldn't, you know, you know, they would say, well, go, you know, go to the website and do this and such. What website in the middle of nowhere? You know, I, my phone won't work in the middle of nowhere. So I can't make an appointment or I can't do this or that because, you know, I'm in the middle of a reservation that, you know, I may not have coverage. And so, again, it was a stark relief um, in whatever was happening in the, in the, the mainstream part of the country, you know, really was, I would say, a, a true burden for the tribes in terms of the lack of technology, the lack of resources. Um, and honestly, uh, also a, a, a not great understanding by the communities surrounding them. And here I want to just point out like a, in South Dakota, when, uh, for example, you know, the tribe, I think it was uh, Cheyenne River, Cheyenne River Sioux, they set up checkpoints. Well, that became national news because, you know, suddenly, you know, the, the white ranchers and farmers couldn't pass through the reservation, <laughs> you know, when these are people that were just trying to keep their, their community safe. And so that turned into a big dogfight with a governor. So I, I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, in terms of, um, education, you know, it's going to be a long haul because I think there's a lot, you know, from, from K through 12, through college, through even graduate school for journalism, you know, it's just not taught. And my hope is that slowly but surely we can start to change some of those numbers. Thank you. So yeah. we, we do have, I was going to say, let's move on to the Q&A because we've got some questions and the clock is ticking. <laughs> so we're just going to go over Hopefully, you know, to 7.15 East Coast time um, in order. Amy, before we do that, I just wanted to quickly uh, uh, just mention that it's really great that we are not surprisingly talking about this through a, a diversity lens, but also um, it, it seems like we're also realizing that diversity is not equity, justice, and inclusion. And, and just a very quick question for Mark to, to end. Before moving on to Q&A, Mark, I know you're interested in creating some educational initiatives and trying to help push that forward. Um, and I know that that's something that's been very much lacking at, at the CUNY J School. Is, is that somewhere, if they were interested, that you'd be interested in maybe trying to host something at the CUNY J School to try to, to, try to make that start happening? 
we could figure it out whether it's me or someone else um but yeah we could figure it out i mean we know at ict that we have a practical problem that as we grow and try to become a modern media company we need people and mm -hmm. how we get people who are ready to go for their careers and that's not just true on the business on the news side but on the business side as well and uh so we're really looking at look at growing our own and being very um thoughtful about that. And one of the programs I mentioned with Robert is a program that we're launching, actually started a test last year, and this year will be more, where we're partnering uh, tribal colleges and uh, Arizona State to bring in students for a class. And hopefully, I think there are a lot of ways that we could configure that going forward. That's fantastic. And to begin, we have a January Academy that's going to be offered at the J School, and that link will go out with all the other resources that we're going to be sharing, including the recording of this. Now on to Q&A. Amy? Yes. Okay. So uh, Thomas Raul, I don't know if I've got that right. He says, Mr. Trahant, uh, what was President Bush's response to your question about what is sovereign and why does it matter? Well, I mean, watch the clip. Um, <laughs> the, the main thing that I took away from that, aside from the answer, and he eventually kind of got it right that sovereignty is sovereignty. <laughs> the thing that was so extraordinary is the notion that the president of the United States who was briefed before a meeting with native journalists wasn't briefed on how to answer this question. And if the president of the United States doesn't know something as basic as that, how are members of Congress? How is the public discourse? I mean, that's what it raises. And it's not the first time a president's been stumped. Another wonderful clip to watch is Ronald Reagan in Russia. And a Russian student asked him about uh, tribes. And he said, well, we created these preservations. Maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we should have told them, come join us, be like the rest of us. And um, the again, the idea of that much ignorance at uh, that level is just stunning. Um, okay, are indigenous peoples dis disproportionately affected by climate change? Yes. And if so, is this getting the attention it needs? No. Yes, they are disproportionately affected and no, they are not getting the attention they need. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Because, you know, it, most reservations, as you, we all know, are out of sight, out of mind. And I can point to northern Wisconsin and Minnesota at this point with, you know, line three. Um, that's not in the national news. But, you know, this is something that is really going to deeply impact Bad River, Red Cliff, and all the other tribes that are along, you know, their waterways. Um, and so... Yeah, no, climate change is affecting the tribe. I mean, now it, it, then you think of the, the agriculture they, they're engaged with, right? So let's just look at the Hopi and their corn, um, you know, their crops. I mean, they do grow crops. I mean, you know, and they're not, it's either too hot, too dry, too wet. That's a big problem. I mean, it's, that's why I'm glad we moved away from the term global warming because it's not warming, it's climate change. I mean, so I just think, I mean, point blank, the tribes are definitely being impacted. And I, and I really am concerned for the ones, especially in the coastal regions, um, you know, out in California and in Washington and Oregon, uh, because I think that's something. And then we have actually, now that I'm thinking about it, and uh, Salish Kootenai, I know they've had major problems with fires also. Um, that's another thing. Fires uh, has been a, a big uh, problem for the tribes in Northern California where the, you know, there's very little um, understory burning. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. We could have a whole panel just on climate change and tribes, but uh, yeah, that they are not, they are definitely being impacted at, I think a more severe rate than, um, than their neighbors and they don't get the attention that I think they deserve. Totally. Um, that, that last question, Chris, of Terry Pluma. Thank you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question from Jenny Klein. Has COVID had an impact on reporting or news sharing? I think the answer is yes. We just want to know how. <laughs> how right. has it impacted right. it? Massively. Well, early on, we realized that we didn't have enough information. I mean, as I mentioned, we had no um, acknowledgement about the death toll, and we wanted to figure out how to do that. 
So we actually built a database of, and you really is kind of morbid in the sense of collecting uh, death statistics. And um, it got to the point where we knew it was gonna get bigger than what we could. And we partnered with Johns Hopkins University and it's now uh, using their global mapping system continuing. Um, it's really interesting because um, the story, and this is a good example of the media, everyone wanted to go to Navajo and talk about the high rates of Navajo. And that certainly was a problem, but because we were mapping it and had data in real time, we knew that the Pueblos were much higher. And we were able to report that and uh, talk about what was going on. Most of the Pueblos then completely shut down in a really, um, in, in fact, today you still can't go into some of the Pueblo villages. We also reported, and this is a story you probably haven't seen anywhere else, on communities that never got a single case. And that's because they completely shut down, isolated, and uh, have been along that line. Um, so we learned a lot during this whole thing. We, we um, I think one really important part of the story is that this is just the beginning, not the end. We know from all of the science on climate change that diseases are gonna grow in new ways. And we need to be prepare, prepared for more pandemics and how we cover them and how uh, we adapt uh, to that. I would now, say that, um, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Please, Suzette. No, I'd love to hear no, your I'm answer. just gonna say, it, you know, most of the work I do is on the road. So uh, a couple of my projects were delayed for over a year because we had to wait because uh, a couple of the team got sick or one of the participants got sick or, you know, so it, it, it was a challenge, but we did it. <laughs> you know, so yes, it, it was a challenge uh, to to do the kind of like, because I was doing a little mini documentary series. And so we had to, you know, I didn't want to do it on Zoom. So we had to wait. And that was sort of a, it was a challenge, but we we finally pushed it out into the world in December. So go ahead. Now, now uh, this next question is uh, apparently from my kid in the next room over. Uh, how do you think teachers can truthfully, truthfully incorporate the real history of colonization of native lands? The end, fifth grade. Mark? <laughs> well, I think the recognition that it's a long history. I mean, the good news about colonization is it's only 300 years. I mean, it really is tiny. <laughs> it has no significance. Um, over time, it's a story to be told, but it incorporates into so many other things. Um, I think it's having that long arc view and being able to explain how things fit together yeah. and how things will be changed by it. The, the dirty secret of colonization is that it does more damage to the colonizers. That is true. That is true. Um, I, I would say I, I don't I don't know because honestly and I don't know if this is the case for Mark but every single year at Thanksgiving I had to go to the school to explain to the teachers like what things really are <laughs> you know I mean it's an ongoing you know one thing that uh, there's a woman that uh, we all know um, and uh, Gay Kingman and she, she always says, she's an elder in Indian country, and she always says, I will never be unemployed because there's just so much misinformation about Native people. And it's kind of true. I think it's an ongoing process. It's going you know, it's, it's, it's to be an ongoing process from now on, I think, to try to really explain like how, you know, why things are the way they are, how, how everything fits together, and how we all manage to make it to 2021. Um, okay, so we have some questions in the chat. Um, you mentioned the success of a dental health intervention program in Alaska. Are there any other projects or initiatives that you think are innovative or exemplary? Sure, telehealth. Uh, telehealth was invented in Indian country. That is true. Uh, it's a great way to get doctors to, I mean, now in Zoom era, we think it's nothing, but 10 years ago, uh, tribal communities were the only ones using it. That's true. And through the University of Colorado, they started with uh, telehealth medicine for, uh, it was uh, therapy. It was therapy yeah. sessions uh, that they were offering for uh, veterans, actually, that they were able to provide that. Now it's, you know, widespread, but it took a pandemic to get at that, <laughs> to get to that. 
I feel like any remote anything began in Indian country because <laughs> like the land is just so spread yeah. out that, you know. Um, another question here, um, could you comment on the Johnson O'Malley Act? I worked at a counselor for children in Alaska and the program was supported by JOM funds. What areas does JOM support now in addition to educational and cultural? Uh, Mark, I don't know. Sure. Um, <laughs> JOM and, um, well, there's three main federal programs that are used by local schools, and JOM is one of them. The other one, and they keep changing it, it's title, I think six now. And then the third one is Impact Aid. And all of those provide a funding stream for local school districts to provide Indian education. And they basically go through a series of changes in terms of um, how they're applied. I do know a political story about JOM is um, when the Indian Education, when the Indian Self-Determination and Education Reform Act was uh, first introduced, before it was, um, be, when reform was in the title, one of the things they wanted to do was get rid of JOM. And um, George McGovern was from South Dakota and all those folks that had JOM programs in every little county called him up and said, you can't change this, you can't change this. So they actually dropped reform from the title of the bill and it never got in because they didn't want to touch JOM. Great, well, uh, we have more questions, but uh, unfortunately that's all the time we have. Um, maybe we could pass them on to panelists um, and we'll, like I said, be sending those resources to y'all. A uh, bunch of links, a bunch of information about some of these really critical issues like Public Law 280, uh, the McGirt decision, Brackeen, which is another Supreme Court case uh, that, that yeah, we didn't even begin to talk about that. And that will be immensely impactful. So we want to share resources with those of you who are interested in learning about these things and possibly covering some of this, uh, as well as recording for this. And, um, and I'll, I'll be happy to share my contact information. And I'm not going to them on the spot now, but maybe the panelists would be interested in, in sharing their contact information in that email as well. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amy. You've been so amazing to plan and co-host this with. Mark, Suzette, uh, your brilliant thoughts have been so insightful and I uh, can't wait to hear from more from both of y'all soon. Uh, Emily, uh, who's still lurking in the background there, thank you so much for helping get this organized and pushing the school to, to try to do better in terms of addressing Indigenous issues. And Jen, thank you also for uh, really doing a lot to, to help organize this and put this together, uh, as well as everybody else who's been on the team trying to make sure that we are really uh, uh, addressing all of these matters that are just coming to the floor at our school and definitely need to be addressed much more directly and consistently. Um, looking forward to all the changes that we'll be seeing arising in the coming Thank years. You so much, we really do appreciate it. I really, it's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you too. And, oh, and Mark, thanks for thanks for summoning our Pueblo uh, ancestors, uh, <laughs> uh, our internet answers, because my light has been blinking on and off since you mentioned that. So um, I'm glad they're here with us as well. Very good. Any, any final thoughts? No, I'm delighted to be a part of this. All right, well, please support these two fabulous journalists and their work see their names follow them on twitter like follow them wherever they exist and just keep supporting indian country today they're just an amazing outlet and thank you all so much for joining we're just so thrilled that you all came this is awesome thank you